All right, I'm going to grab uh, this clicker so I don't have to be sort of cooked up on this side. This room is a little weird with the pillar, but uh, I'll try to be on this side more. <laughs> All right, so good morning again. I'm a diabetes uh, doctor. I focus, uh, my main interest is in type 2 diabetes and obesity. Um, and uh, I think throughout the day, some of the themes will overlap. But I'll focus more on just the basic understanding of diabetes, what the diagnostic criteria and treatment options are. So, and I have to thank my colleague, uh, Sharita Golden, for most of these slides. Um, again, the objectives today would be to review uh, who are at risk for developing the diabetes, uh, what, you know, how do we diagnose diabetes, and what are some of the treatment options. So, you know, this is... Um, this is such an epidemic disease, right, diabetes. So how many of us are personally or you know, know someone, loved one with diabetes, you know, including myself, right? I mean, it's just, it impacts so many people. Um, right off the bat, you know, if you came across a good friend or a family member who was impacted with, with diabetes, what would be your first inkling? What, what are some of the things that you've noticed your friends or loved ones go through? to treat diabetes or to you know, deal with diabetes. Some, some folks just get overwhelmed at the amount of just like self-care that has to go into it. Like yeah. if you have to self-inject insulin, mm -hmm. and some folks sort of run out of medications and have a hard time getting back with their primary care provider for refills. Absolutely. Diet. Diet. Well, actually the cost of medication too, that's a big thing that we hear mm -hmm. Yeah. Just the cost of medication. Oh yeah, it's a, uh, it's, it's, it's a very expensive disease, you know, even the, just check your, you know, glucose with the, you know, meter, you know, that could be expensive, the medications, and, and the fact that we don't, unfortunately, have a cure, so it's a chronic disease, just like hypertension you heard about, you know, and some um, hyperlipidemia, the, you know, we have good tools to manage it, but not a, a cure, so there's a lot of frustration regarding that, just accepting the fact that, you know, you have to kind of manage this, you know, lifelong, and cost involved, and the, sort of the, you know, the burden that comes with it emotionally, psychologically, absolutely. So uh, let's go down to the basics, first of all, for everybody here. I'm sure many of you know already that diabetes means your blood sugar is out of control. And why is that? Because you, you know, typically in, under normal circumstance, you have a hormone called insulin, and it helps the body to uptake, take up glucose as fuel and use it, you know, so for energy. And if you don't make enough, if you don't make any insulin or you make very little insulin, you're going to run into problems and you're going to develop diabetes. So in general, we have two types of diabetes. The vast majority of diabetes out there that you may have come across and you may hear are type 2 diabetes. That's the adult onset diabetes where you make insulin um, and you didn't have any problems uh, earlier on and something along the way, you probably have genetic disposition probably through the family history or, you know, environment, you know, there are many various reasons why, but at some point in life, you lose that ability to make enough insulin. And the enough that you, that the little that you make may not even work well. So that's the type 2 diabetes that's very, very common. Over 90% of the diabetes you come across will be type 2. Type 1 is where um, it's sometimes called juvenile diabetes uh, until, you know, unfortunately, obesity impacting the kids as well. Now there's actually a lot of type 2s as well, so we sort of don't even use that term. But type 1 typically affects people earlier on in life because they have sort of an autoimmune condition where they sort of attack their own body organ and, and ends up um, you, you know, losing that ability to make insulin. So for type 1, what do you think the treatment might be for someone who doesn't make insulin? Insulin. Exactly, right? So you know the reason is they don't make insulin, so you give insulin as treatment, whereas type 2, they make enough to get out of trouble, but just not enough to keep the glucose under good control so that you can start off with medications, oral medications, and eventually insulin. So that's the differentiation there. Um, in type two, we also use the term insulin resistance. You might have come across it. When we use the, resist when we use the word resistance, it just means uh, you, know, you need more of it to make the same impact. So you may you know, need this much insulin to control your blood sugar in the past, but now you need a lot more. That's called insulin resistance. And you know, some of the mechanisms exactly why we end up using more insulin to have the same impact is not entirely clear. Uh, but there are different organs that's impacted by it. You know, this picture is just to appreciate that pancreas, which is a you know, little organ that sits on behind your stomach, is the organ that makes insulin, right? 
and the liver and, and uh, the beta cells. Um, that's basically the, the cells that are critical within the pancreas that make insulin. And you know, they, they seem to have some you know, dysfunction or some damage that leads to diabetes. So again, insulin resistance. Some uh, couple pictures to sort of help us understand that concept. Again, um, you know, when we have insulin floating around, it allows the cells to take in the fuel, namely glucose, right, among other things. And the cells can, you know, use it as energy. If you don't have insulin working well, or you don't have enough of it, you just don't, the cells are, can, can just see the glucose passing by, but they cannot, they, they cannot accept it and use it as fuel, right? So ironically, you can eat all you want, and the energy is floating, circulating in your blood, and you check your sugar, it's actually high, but the cells are seeing it as starvation, right? They can't even access the glucose, right? So, so when the body's unable to make enough insulin, or insulin is not working well, we call that you know, insulin resistance. And in fact, insulin resistance can be a part of this whole um, bigger picture. And the reason why we talk about it is because there's some health implications, right? So if you have insulin resistance, chances are you might even have you know, co uh, coexisting high blood pressure or elevated you know, lipids. Uh, and maybe you have abdominal obesity, so typically around your belly, you know, that, that kind of fat is w worse off. It's called visceral adiposity versus fat elsewhere. And all these things combined, we know for sure that it increased the, uh, the cardiovascular risk. And that's sort of what, you know, what we're focused on here to reduce that in the long run. So symptoms of diabetes. So if someone didn't have diabetes and you know, it creeped up on them, right? So over time, the blood sugar is rising. Um, and eventually it gets to the point where you, you have diabetes. Uh, when you ask those people, guess what? Most of the time, they will not have any symptoms, right? So this is a tricky part. So there are people, half the people that have diabetes out there don't know they have diabetes, right? That's sort of the uh, tricky thing about it, right? You could have elevated blood sugar, but you may not feel anything. Or it creeps on, on you so slowly that your body sort of adjusts and you think you're tired and maybe you're urinating a little more than before or you're thirsty a little more, but not dramatically, right? To the point where you, you say, you know, I need to get this checked up by, you know, at, at the doctor's office. So that's one thing. But if you, if, if you did have some, you know, more urgently elevated blood sugar, your body will feel, you know, uh, some of these symptoms. You can feel nausea, fatigue, you know, urinating a lot, thirsty, Lower vision, frequent infections, um, slow healing of the wounds, or actually weight loss because again you're eating all that you know calories, but it's actually being peed out, right? Because your body is not absorbing it as energy, using it as fuel. So ironically, you you actually you know start to lose weight, and, and the doc, you know patients might say, yeah, I, you know I notice I'm losing weight, uh, and e even though I'm not trying. Because you know, in this day and age, when people are losing weight in, and they're not trying, that, you know, that's usually concerning, right? So that could be a reason to uh, screen for diabetes. So who are at risk? So when, when you're out there and you know, having you know, interactions with you know, community members, um, who, are, you know, who are the people that we should keep in mind, right? Might be at elevated risk. So age matters, you know, um, with age, um, you know, your beta cell function. So beta cells, what I mean by that is those cells that in the pancreas that make insulin. So those cells can just, you know, decline in, in function over time. So with age, your risk goes up. Um, obesity, go, you know, also plays a role. Turns out that the fat cells we thought were just uh, sort of passive storage, you know, cells. They just hold on to energy for the times that we're gonna need it. Turns out they're also actively involved in metabolism. So they you know, secrete hormones, they send signals to our body, to our brain saying, yes, we have enough energy, or it actually you know, sends some inflammatory sense, uh, you know, signals that could interrupt with what insulin wants to do. So it sort of counteracts how insulin works and maybe feeds into that insulin resistance concept where you make insulin, but it no longer works well, right? So, you could, so that's why obesity can play a role uh, in elevating the risk for you know, diabetes. Physically inactive lifestyle probably feeds into you know gaining the weight, but also turns out muscles are great you know at chewing off all those glucose, right? So when you eat something, and let's say you have diabetes, if you're active, right, it's 
it's you know we we're gonna you know t learn this throughout the day, but not only does it you know improve health, but it actually lowers your blood sugar. You know I tell my patients you know try taking a walk after dinner, right? Not only will it help in the long run to improve your you know overall health, but it's it's visibly going to blood drop your blood sugar, right? So sometimes that's my bargaining chip for somebody who, you know, I'm, I'm thinking of adding a medication or adding insulin, right? And then ask them to see, you know, what, what exercise does to their blood sugar. Turns out, you know, again, if you use those muscles, they're going to need fuel, right? So glucose is going to be taken up as fuel, and you're going to see the blood sugar improve, right? So the other, you know, the opposite of that is, you know, not being active. Well, you're going to just not help yourself, right? If the blood sugar is going to be elevated if you're already at risk. Um, hypertension and cholesterol, so these, you know, I can't really tell you the exact mechanism on how that elevates the risk, but, you know, through various, you know, multiple studies throughout, you know, uh, until, up, up until now, we know that patients who actually have hypertension or uh, trouble with uh, blood cholesterol levels are, you know, happen to also have elevated risk for diabetes. So we, we need to just keep that in mind because, again, hypertension tends to be common, right? Gestational diabetes. So this is sort of a stress test for a woman, right? If you can, you know, let's see if you can support two, you know, two people, right, in one body and see how your, you know, pancreas handles that stress kind of thing, right? So some folks, um, you know, not to mention that you're, you know, sort of baking this new, you know, human being, but the placenta um, also secretes hormones that counteract insulin. So there are direct reasons why um, you know, your glucose level tends to go up if you already have that family history or you know, you're at risk and then you become pregnant. It's not uncommon for people to have problems with blood sugar. Um, it's called gestational diabetes. Um, more than not, when, you know, after the delivery, the problem goes away. Right, because the placenta's out, the baby's out, the body's able to restore its normal function. But unfortunately, those people are not off the hook, so they are at increased risk for type two diabetes in the long run. So if you have a history of gestational diabetes, or even you know maybe not even met that criteria, but was kind of teetering, you know, on the verge of it, you should be you know um, discussing that with your doctor and getting things you know getting screened um, you know frequently. So um, pre diabetes. Uh, no brainer. Somebody, I'll, I'll, tell, I'll give you some more um, sort of visual uh, cues on that. But if you already have gl glucose that's not normal, you know, this is sort of a spectrum, right? We we have always have to make cutoffs for calling something <coughs> disease, but it's never that clean, right? So somebody could be on the normal on this side. If this is disease. There's always that gray zone, right? So but if you're in the gray zone, you're obviously going to be at elevated risk. So that's the pre-diabetes there. And we also know that you know, certain ethnicities, African Americans, Latinos, uh, Native American, Asian Americans, Pacific Islanders are you know, certainly at an increased risk, you know, above all else too. So there's just you know, something else to keep in mind. Um, in fact, you know, the, we, we don't really understand why, but you know, this level of you know, increase in the risk for diabetes and for example, African Americans versus the rest, you know, it's pretty, pretty dramatic. So we need to keep that in mind as well. So, how do we diagnose diabetes? So, if someone walks in to my door and say, you know, I'm having, you know, increased, uh, you know, urination, I'm, I'm very thirsty a lot, I lost weight recently, and I check their glucose in the clinic, and glucose is, two, you know, 250, okay? Um, I can make that diagnosis of, yeah, you have diabetes, right? Um, or, you know, maybe fasting glucose greater than, um, should be actually 125 there, and uh, two hour, uh, equal, yeah, equal or greater than 126. And then, uh, or um, we could do, we could, I can do a little challenge, right? I can give you um, 75 grams of uh, sugar, sugary beverage, um, um, and then check your glucose two hours later and see how, we, how high it goes up. So giving you this challenge, and I know what the cutoff should be for normal and not normal. Um, and there's something called hemoglobin A1C. How many of you have heard of hemoglobin A1C? Okay, we have some cool pictures coming up as well, but I could do a quick blood test now. Uh, it tells you an average sugar over three months of time, and there's normal, you know, normal range for it, there's abnormal range for it. If you meet 6.5 or greater, I made your diagnosis. 
In fact, you know, I, 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 I can't think of the last time I did an oral glucose tolerance test because you, usually patients would have either fasting or, you know, um, after meal or random glucose or A1C or kind of combination of those, those two and plus minus symptoms, I, you know, that's more than enough for me, right? Um, so this is the gray zone, you know, what, what if you did have this uh, oral glucose tolerance test, it's not quite 200 something, you know, but it should be less than 140 for normal people. So you have that impaired glucose tolerance range in between. Um, and we use the term impaired fasting glucose again, when we know what the normal range should be, right? And if it's sort of in the gray zone between normal and what the, what's, what's meeting the diagnostic criteria, 126, that's the gray zone. So we use in term impaired fasting glucose. These two categories, just to, you know, the big take home is really that you're, you're not off the hook. If you're at that, in that range, you should certainly, you know, watch out because, you know, you could develop diabetes in the future. And uh, same thing, we have a gray zone for A1C. So if you have absolutely no problems with, you know, glucose handling, your A1C should be, you know, low fives, low, you know, high fours, right? So if you're in that range that's not quite high enough for the cutoff for diabetes, and it's still abnormal, then it's in that pre-diabetes range. Does that make sense? So all three of these, I would call these pre-diabetes. Would you say that it's, it's a good rule to practice for, for wellness visits if somebody did not have diabetes to get their hemoglobin A1C checked annually at least? Yeah, that's a good question. So that goes down to, I would say, the risk profile. Right. Okay. So if you have, you know, you're, if you're age greater than 45, you know, and you have some of these other risk factors, I think it's perfectly make, you know, it makes sense to get screened perhaps annually or, you know, every two years, you know, depending on you and your doctor's suspicion. Mm -hmm. But certainly, if you have any of these risk factors, um, you know, I think it's a it's a no brainer because diabetes is so common, right? Mm -hmm. You could even be screened for. And maybe you fall in the pre-diabetes range, but that's also a good reason to follow up and maybe check annually the A1Cs. So absolutely, I think, I think it's underutilized because we have such uh, pretty, pretty cl clear cutoffs, right? It's, and these tests, these tests are not expensive per se. So I think it's reasonable to think about, you know, screening. So we talked about diagnosing someone, and um, you know, what are the treatments? Um, so, you know, we talked about it already before about the lifestyle, and I think some of, the, some of these uh, slides overlap uh, in terms of the general theme, right? So I think you guys know as well as I do in this room about the healthy lifestyle, right? And, you know, part of how I pitch it to my patients is that I don't say, you know, you have to now commit yourself to a diabetic diet, right? It's just because you have diabetes. It's literally a heart-healthy diet. It's a diet that I would have recommended to you even if I saw you in clinic without the diagnosis of diabetes, mm -hmm. right? You, 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 you think it's that way. Mm -hmm. right? It's really low in you know, added sugars, right? Added fat, things that you would need anyway if you would recommend to your loved ones if you wanted that person to live healthy, mm -hmm. right? To their full life. It's that, you know, so if you think of it that way, you know, it's not sort of a burden on, on them, right? Um, so you know, if you keep that in mind, you know, some of these bullet points make total sense, right? Reducing calories in general, why? Because you want to avoid obesity, right? Um, and eat smaller meals if you can, um, you know, saturated <coughs> fat, you know, to try to decrease that. Um, and, um, you, know, eat, you know, really just, um, you know, trying to do a lot of fruits and vegetables first, more than anything else. Um, Again, if you unless you're type one diabetes, and I suspect you know that will be far in between for any of us to deal with. But type one diabetes, you know, you just have to be more uh, savvy about recognizing carbohydrates because they actually may have to you know count those things to figure out how much insulin to give. Okay, mm -hmm. so that's a specific group, that's a special group, and I again suspect that's going to be very rare. Uh, for the vast majority of the diabetic patients you may come across, they're going to have type two, right? So what they need to re recognize is that they need to be mindful of things that has carbohydrates because carbohydrate containing foods will increase your blood sugar more directly than let's say we talked about that steak with a big salad right mm -hmm. that's gonna not raise your blood sugar as much uh, versus having 
you know, pasta, rice, potatoes, you know, cereal, you know. I go through this list and my page is like, oh my god, those are all the things I love. <laughs> Academic. And that's mm -hmm. why this generation might be dying off sooner than our former generation. I mean, this is the, the, the way we think about it is just really scary out there. Right. right? So therefore, a lot of this is about thinking ahead. So you don't make yourself starving, hungry, and you know, set yourself up for, for decisions. And then physical activity, again, I, I play that you know, diabetes doctor card and say, you know, is it not only going to help you in the long run with your heart, heart healthy, you know, heart, heart health, but it's also going to visibly reduce your blood sugar, right? So if I need to you know, write a prescription, say exercise 30 minutes a day at the minimum, and hold off on my next diabetes medication prescription, I will, right? But it's literally almost equivalent, right? So do you want me to start you on an insulin or you want to do more exercise, right? Sometimes it's not, you know, I'm, I'm a little exaggerating, but it goes a long way to think about, you know, really changing your life uh, and, and exercise, incorporating it as if you're taking a medication. It's not an option. It's not like when you feel good and you feel like you have two hours extra that you want to just, you know, burn off, then go ahead and exercise. Like none of us have that. I mean, I talk about, you know, with my patients about making appointments to yourself. I mean, it's kind of sad, but that's kind of what I have to do, right? Make appointments with yourself to exercise on a time that you know is going to be working for you. Not leave it at the end of the day, but make a commitment. It's like making an appointment to go see a doctor or whatever you know, it, it is. Go see a movie or something fun, but um, you know, make it a priority. That's kind of what I'm getting at. <clears throat> and you, know, you can achieve all of these. You know, weight control, you know, improving your you know, uh, cardiovascular health, and lowering your blood sugar. So, you know, be creative about exercise, right? So what do I mean by exercise? I think you, you, know, you guys went through that already. Um, I really think about what my patients are capable of doing, right? Mm -hmm. It's no good to give, you know, give, give them op, you know, options that's not gonna work for them, mm -hmm. right? So I do inquire about, do you have any you know, access to a place where you can walk safely, a, a park, a gym, you know, anywhere? I mean, some of you know, the extreme cases would be somebody on a wheelchair who is like paraplegic, you know, and is unable to really even get out of the house. And I have some of those patients too. So I have to really tailor my, you know, um, advice so that it works. And sometimes you just have to be creative. You know, I just tell those patients who are really limited, extremely limited, to just grab water bottles and do some, you know, exercise. You know, every time that you see a commercial, go ahead and do some, you know, some kind of activity, you know, like chair yoga or whatever have you. But it doesn't have to be like training for a triathlon, right? which I'm not gonna do myself either, right? So, Really figuring out, talking with your uh, folks about what would be ideal um, to get that going. And it could be, I mean, I think there was an even better list before about incorporating physical activity in your life, right? Using stairs, parking a little further out. All those things count. So um, this is a busy slide, but it's actually, you know, we're very fortunate to have a whole slew of medication options for diabetes. Um, in fact, some of these medications, like this class, class right here, and some of the ones uh, coming up next, they weren't even in my medical school curriculum. Like, you know, I want to say 30, 40, I'm not even that old, but you know, 30, 40% of the medications I use now were not even taught to me because they were so new. They're so new, like, you know, after my training, they came about in, in the market, um, which is a very exciting time, right? Which tells you that we're making strides to give, you know, make more medical options available. I mean, if you think about just 50 years, 60 years from, uh, you know, ago, um, we had a few pills and maybe like one type of insulin. You know, you, you times 10, you know, that amount, and that's what you got now. It's kind of mind-boggling, actually. So, um, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a lot of cool medication options out there right now. Um, just to give you a flavor of what they are, you know, we have medications, pills, that tells the pancreas to secrete more insulin, right? Because part of the problem in type 2 diabetes is you just don't make enough insulin, right? So we have pills to uh, tell the pancreas to do that. We have, uh, you know, medications like metformin, which makes um, liver smarter. So liver turns out when you don't eat, why is it that our blood sugar doesn't drift down to, you know, the level that's gonna kill us, right? Why is it that when we're not eating right now, our blood sugar is not being eaten up by our expensive organs like brain and heart and all these 
organs that love to chow down energy. It's because the liver stores some of our um, energy for 24 hour use. It's like a short term battery right here in the liver. So when we're not eating, it actually um, you know, secretes some of that sugar that we've eaten like a couple hours ago back into the bloodstream. And so when I, I wore this uh, continuous glucose monitor, it's a monitor that you can wear, it checks your blood sugar every five minutes. Mm -hmm. You might have heard of it. Um, and it was just unbelievable to me, you know. I have a high risk for diabetes myself, like all my family members have diabetes. So it was good to, at least for now, to see that my sugar was just amazingly stable. I mean, just think about what your body has to do. You know, I went to, to you know, to, to work, and then I went to, you know, like my gym, and then I went eating this, and I kind of track all that. And the glucose was just like this, you know. And just think about all the smart things that the brain, I mean, the entire body, so we don't understand to this, you know, probably not all of it. Um, so part of what that, what the liver does to make my blood sugar that stable and, you know, most, I, hopefully most of us, us here, is that the liver is also able to secrete some of the sugar back to the bloodstream when the blood sugar is low, right? Part of the problem in diabetes is that liver is on an overtime. So it actually makes more sugar than it should. And, that, and so when the patient wakes up in the morning, their sugar is actually higher than it should be, right? So metformin tells the liver to not work over time, for example. Um, and then the stomach, you know, we have medications to slow down the, the absorption. You know, if we eat that bowl of pasta, instead of, you know, blood sugar just kind of skyrocketing, some of the medications may actually slow down that absorption at the GI level, okay? Another smart medication, you know, something like pioglutazone, tells the fat tissue to not secrete, again, some of the uh, glucose that's, uh, you know, stored, or inflammation to be worse. Uh, it tells the muscle to do a better job at, a, you know, at utilizing glucose. Uh, and then this is the latest uh, class of drugs where I, it was pretty disturbing to me when they first came in the market. It basically helps us pee out glucose, right? So it turns out, you know, kidney is a big filter, and 95% of our sugar that's filtered through this uh, big filter of our body gets re-taken uh, up, right? Because we, we don't want to be eating and then peeing out all our, you know, calories, right? So, you know, the kidney is very smart, and it has a way to reclaim all the sugar once the blood is filtered and everything's cleaned up. Well, some folks said, well, why don't we block some of that? and let us pee out some of the urine, and it's going to uh, you know, lower the blood sugar. And uh, you know, it's, it's a pretty exciting time, because I think it, even though the concept is a little uh, disturbing, um, you know, some of the data has been encouraging, and it also actually lowers your blood sugar and, and helps you lose weight. Well, surprise, surprise, right? Um, <clears throat> but I think this, is, this class of drugs has the least amount of data, you know, five to 10 years of data, so it's, it, you know, it's, we have to learn as a, as a sort of a society on how that's going to pan out. But I think this slide really demonstrates the different various degrees of, you know, targeting of, you know, body parts that we can do to help with blood sugar control. And, you know, frankly, the more, you know, options we have, the better, right? Because some people might have side effects and whatnot. So it's been an exciting time to treat diabetes. And this slide shows you the various different types of insulin. The takeaway is really that, again, you know, you know, 50 years ago, 60 years ago, I could only show you one or two of these, right? Now I have a dizzying, you know, different types of, you know, medications, insulin, I mean, that have short actions, you know, action of time, or they work over a long period of time. Mm -hmm. uh, we have medications now in the in the market and in the works that go all the way down like this. You know, they last like, you know, three, four days. I mean, it's just, you know, because diabetes, again, is an epidemic, there's a lot of effort, obviously, going on to improve uh, treatments. And this is a, you know, this is a, one of the newer classes of drugs, like I told you, that came about, you know, after I, you know, finished my training, kind of, you know, with my med school. You know, there were a bunch of medications that came, up, came around. So this is the Gila monster. And it's a lizard that lives 95% of the time underground and comes only 5% of their, you know, its lifetime to, to eat. Um, it turns out in its venom was this uh, really interesting protein that turned into a drug. And that is used, uh, it's one of my favorite drugs. Most of my patients who have type 2 diabetes and obesity gets this drug now. Mm -hmm. Because it's a, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a drug that, um, you know, lowers their blood sugar and also helps with weight loss. Mm -hmm. 
and you know, I, um, just to go, goes to show you that you know, look at the amount of drugs that came out of this concept. So what happens is the gut turns out to be another endocrine, you know, hormone producing, you know, mm -hmm. uh, organ. So what happens is um, if I give you the same amount of sugar and you you know you ate it through your normal you know just like you ate it versus if I inject it into your vein, the body is so smart when you eat it through the normal route on how to handle it so much better than if you give it through your blood vessel, right? Mm -hmm. And it's partly because your body also makes hormones, not just insulin, but turns out something called GLP-1. Um, and it helps with really, you know, reacting in an optimal way to handle blood sugar. So, I mean, it's, it's just, you know, fascinating, right? So, you know, it's a lot of cool medications in, in the market. I think for your purpose, realize that there's, you know, various different new drugs. Um, this particular, this case, in, uh, this, these classes are actually injectables. Uh, they're working on non-injectables, of course, but right now it is. And so if your t patient says, you know, I'm on a medic diabetes medication that's injectable, but it's not insulin, you, you know which one. Mm -hmm. So Sarah, yeah. which one is your favorite one? one well, the most data on the weight loss is really in the liraglutide. Mm -hmm. This is a daily injection versus exenatide by ETA, which comes in two flavors, twice daily <coughs> and once weekly. So I might do these two. Albiglutide is the, uh, the least weight loss inducing effect. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I'm stuck with what insurance covers, mm -hmm. but I do a lot of Victoza, to be honest. Mm -hmm. And Victoza is actually um, packaged as Exenda at a higher dose to be marketed towards people without diabetes. They just want to lose weight. I can actually prescribe it. Wow. Yeah. So it's a brave new world. Yeah. <laughs> so, all right, let's talk about, now that we know how to diagnose, we know, we know a little bit about treatment options out there, you know, how do, what do, how do we coach our patients to, you know, uh, monitor and, and, you know, manage their diabetes? So, you know, they should at least know their A1C and glucose meter results. So what do I mean by that? I think, um, go a little bit into details again, we touched, you know, many of you have heard of A1C again. It's a... Uh, it's a great tool to get a sense of your average sugar over a span of two to three months. And um, so you wouldn't check necessarily two, you know, it, it, it's no good to check you know, every few weeks, right? It's not gonna change that quickly. The higher the number, the worse it is. And, um, you know, what turns out that, um, you know, red blood cells that make our blood red um, are covered in sugar, just a small portion of it. But you can imagine if you have diabetes, you have more blood sugar, so the red blood cells are going to be more covered in, you know, covered in uh, blood sugar. So the, po the percentage of red blood cells covered in sugar is going to go up, and that's what we're measuring. And so, um, you know, we have a way of sort of going back and forth between what the glucometer bl blood sugar might show you versus what A1C shows you. So if I have someone who comes into clinic and they say, I check my blood sugar a couple times a day, and we can actually get a report of this, and they'll tell you, like, your average blood sugar, based on all the numbers you've collected throughout the last few months, let's say it was 150, then that tells me the A1C translates to probably 7%, okay? And if you remember, the diagnostic criteria is 6.5, right? In, in treatment, we really want people to be, in, you know, having A1C of 7 or less in general. So that's kind of, you know, talking about average sugar of 150 or less. That's our goal, okay? So here we go. So A1C of 7% or less would be great. Um, you know, if you didn't have any diabetes, your sugar should never go above 100. Even if, if, even if you had the, you know, most, the biggest pasta meal, you would, your glucose would remain under 140, right? So our goal is to be as close to normal as possible with a little bit of give, of course. Um, and what's the bottom line here? Why are we, you know, we're gonna, how are we gonna convince our patients to be caring about their glucose control? because of its implications on um, diabetes complications, right? Diabetes is a slow, silent disease. Uh, it's, it is scary for its complications, not so much the blood sugar. You know, all my patients, they say, you know, I feel fine, you know, my, their blood sugar is at 500, right? Um, and I tell them, you know, you, you, you're not gonna feel any different if your blood sugar was high, but 10 years from now, you know, 20 years from now, 50 years from now, I want you to be healthy without these complications. And um, it's really about a marathon. You know, it's a long, you know, long-term play. It's not, it's not about a, you know, short-term race, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, what are some of the complications? We divide it up into two groups. So we call 
one group microvascular complications and the other group macrovascular. So micro, as you can imagine, small vessels, right? So you can have problems with kidneys, uh, eyes, and nerve damage. Um, so these are the problems that can you know, come about if you have a long, prolonged periods of poorly controlled diabetes. Um, so kidney problems, for example, you, we can check you know, annually what, what protein you might be spilling in your urine as an early screen before we, you know, so we can act you know, earlier. Um, there, you know, it turns out that you know, vast majority of the kidney problems in, in this country are due to what? Like a wild guess, what's the topic of today? It's diabetes and hypertension, right? So by treating those two things um, and, and do an annual screen to be on top of it, if there are any early signs of damage, you know, that's the best way to really prevent a full-blown kidney problems. Uh, retinopathy, again, what is the number one reason for blindness in this country? Diabetes. Yeah, that was a wild guess, but it worked, yes, that's correct. <laughs> so we do, a, you know, I send my patients for early, you know, a annual um, screening. So it's not one of those uh, eye vision check. They're like, oh, yeah, I got my new glasses, I'm good. No, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about dilating your pupil, right? They need to put a drop, and then you kind of can't really see well, and then they look at the back of the eyes, okay? And those are the tiny vessels that feed the back of the eyes, retina, and they can get clogged and inflamed with prolonged periods of diabetes on the point. Again, imagine, it's actually usually um, length dependent. So meaning, what, do, what do I mean by that? So the longest nerve in your body is probably the one feeding the back, like the tip of your toe, right? From the spine, right? Versus the ones that's feeding the tip of your finger. So if somebody says, you know, I'm having problems with my hands, but my feet are fine, I need to think about other reasons for those problems. Whereas if they start to have problems in their toes or their, their, their feet are feeling cold all the time, or pins and needles, or we could call them like you know socks and glove kind of numbness. Then I start to worry, right? And they seem they tend to be symmetrical too. Um, but you know, it kind of we don't know the exact mechanism, but we do think that you know those small vessels that are feeding that tip of your toe nerve. I mean, imagine how tiny those vessels must be. So they're prone to dam damage over a long period of time if diabetes is clogging up those vessels and causing inflammation, right? So. This is the slide talking about the macrovascular, right? So we talked about the micro, now it's macro. So it's large vessel disease. What are the macrovascular complications you know, in, in, in the diabetes world? Um, heart attack and stroke, right? So a little bit more about that. So you know, I always quiz my patients, you know, what do people with diabetes die of? Not from the high blood sugar, right? It's not from the <laughs> glucose of 500, right? It's the complications. It's a heart attack and stroke. And I tell them, this is you know, our goal in this room <coughs> is to prevent heart attack and stroke and other complications. Um, because it affects a rampant you know, number of people, we, to this day, we don't fully understand why the patients with diabetes are such elevated risk. I mean, the risk is equivalent to someone who already had a heart attack. And, and that's, quite, you know, that's quite disturbing, and it's, it's pretty scary. And, and that's why um, we have to look at diabetes in many angles, not just you know, um, controlling your blood sugar, but you know, doing a good job of, you know, with hypertension that may, 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 may coexist, and uh, you know, other risk factors to be reduced as much as possible. Um, and look at that. More than half of patients that newly diagnosed with diabetes may already have you know, cardiovascular disease. So this is, a, this is the elephant in the room, really. This is what we try to um, address you know, for patients with diabetes. Um, and some of the, you know, this just goes on to tell you that some of the uh, risk factors, some of the things that really elevate the risk for diabetes, you know, there's a lot of commonality, right, overlap. So some of the things you would do anyway to improve the, or, or reduce the risk for cardiovascular disease kind of go hand in hand with what you would do for diabetes. So what are some of the no-brainers we would do, right? So smoking cessation, uh, antiplatelet therapy can help, and blood pressure control, right? So these things don't seem very obvious for a diabetes doctor to be talking about. So why should I be controlling the, somebody's blood pressure or talking about smoking cessation? Well, because type 2 diabetes is like cardiovascular disease. So I will be talking about all of these things. And, you know, whether you like it or not, I'm going to have it. You know? And every time, I'm going to bother them. 
<laughs> and um, you know, blood pressure, um, so the target goals are pretty much you know same across you know whether you have diabetes or you know whether you have hypertension and not, no diabetes, right? So you know the overall goal is below 140 over 90. And um, you know what are some of the things we can achieve um, in terms of blood pressure control if you did it without medications? So again, this is where DASH diet would come in. Weight loss can have a fair number of uh, you know blood pressure lowering goal, you know power. So if that was another you know um, bargain chip that we can play, right, uh, to promote weight loss, let 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 it be. Physical activity, kind of going hand in hand with weight loss, can help, and smoking cessation too. So these are things that we should think about for uh, you know patients affected with hypertension. Um, and um, this is this is one big thing in my clinic as well. You know, monitoring their blood uh, cholesterol levels. We're also talking about statin in general. So the latest guidelines, you know, along with uh, all the major you know health organizations, um, basically said. We now have so much data supporting that statin is this wonder drug, right? It helps reduce, you know, to reduce your cardiovascular disease so much mm -hmm. that we don't even care what your cholesterol level is. You know, if you have diabetes, you will get cholesterol medication because it turns out that this medication really reduces the mortality by like 30 percent. You know, and it seems to really work in a mechanism that doesn't really involve cholesterol reduction must be anti-inflammatory, some other things that we may not even fully understand. But the data is very clear that it will help save lives. So my patients sometimes go, you know, I'm already taking like 10 medications, you're trying to give me another one, you know, and I don't, my cholesterol level is good. And then I have to go through what I just told you, <clears throat> that this medication has really been saving lives, that, you know, I'm, I would love to give, the, give this to you as a preventive measure. Uh, you know, a lot of my patients complain, like, I'm taking 10 medications, why? And I'm, uh, you know, I don't have any of these problems. Well, you know, in 2017, we give you medications to prevent a disease instead of, you know, waiting till things occur, right? Some of these medications are just prevent, you know, preventive, and, you know, um, statin is one of those. And so if you come across somebody with diabetes uh, that's not on statin, we should really wonder why, because that's not standard care anymore. Well, um, just a question. Yeah. So with the statins and um, folks who have diabetes, um, is part of the thought also that the statins will help to reduce um, atherosclerotic Atherosclerotic, right. absolutely, yeah. So that's that's exactly right. So it must, uh, we don't, again, some of the thoughts are that it stabilizes atherosclerotic plaques. Mm -hmm. Maybe it prevents it from forming those, you know, nasty pluggings in, in our pipes from the beginning. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so certainly it seems to really help. There's, again, um, Statin is one of the top prescribed drugs in the world, right? Um, there have been concerns um, that are really not, you know, at the level that you should worry about. You know, some patients come to me and say, oh, I heard that this, you know, makes the blood sugar worse. And the other thing is it makes Alzheimer worse, okay? The, the risk of those two things are minuscule compared to the mortality reduction power of this drugs, that it's just not a brain, no-brainer. Um, it does, statin um, classes, if, again, if you, any of you come across these complaints, um, if you were maybe teetering on the verge of converting to diabetes, you were on a pre-diabetic range, and then I started you on statin, yeah, it might kill you over to diabetes. But that's about a couple, couple of I mean, points in the, uh, in the glucometer reading, for mm -hmm. example. It's not going to make someone who has normal blood sugar control and then make them diabetic. Does that make sense? It's only going to affect people that were just teetering on the verge. So overall, you know, the risk, uh, the risk is just so much slow, you know, uh, lower than the benefits of this class. So you know, what, is the, uh, what is the bottom line for diabetes uh, management and successful care? Um, it, takes a, it takes a village, right? And it, it takes a lot of frequent follow-ups that some of our patients are not able to do, but we need to be conscious about uh, making those follow-up appointments happen. Why? Because too many times patients are started either diagnosed or started on some medications and they don't see any provider till about a year later. <clears throat> They've already been living with A1Cs in off-target range and um, you know that's not ideal. So we need to see patients, especially when they're diagnosed, they may, they may well require more than just one, one medication, right? And in order to really um, you know, increase 
the medications or you know add something um, new. Uh, we need you know we th those patients need to be seen sooner than later. So ideally, in three to six months of time would be an, you know would be ideal. So if somebody says you know. Um, you know, I, I have type 2 diabetes and I, I take medications. I know it's not really in great control. And the last time I saw someone was nine months ago or a year ago, two years ago. You know, I hope that, you know, this group can help sort of nudge that person to see someone, right? So that would be a good, you know, I, I, we have a slide for that. <clears throat> um, so changing the treatment, changing the treatment plan. <clears throat> so to add to what I just said, um, oftentimes patients need multiple medication or maybe even insulin if they um, are sort of on a different stage of their diabetes. Um, and what do I mean by different stages? So it turns out diabetes is a progressive disease. So this is something that I have to point out to my patients because sometimes they have this guilt or they're, they're sort of uh, ashamed. You know, they have, they're diagnosed with diabetes, they should know what to do, doctor gave me this drug, you know, maybe I you know, skipped the you know, doses here and there, and maybe it's my fault. It's my fault that you know, my diabetes is out of control. And so I'm embarrassed to go see, you know, Dr. Lee, because she's going to yell at me, uh, and, you know, I don't want to deal with that. Well, I sort of make it clear to them, and hopefully in the, way in the beginning, too, that diabetes is a progressive disease. You know, it's, multi, you know, it's, it's got multiple reasons why you have, you develop diabetes in, in, in the end, but it, it's, you know, quite often, you know, family history plays a role, so you have some genetic makeup that makes you predisposed to diabetes could be environmental on top of that, obesity doesn't help, hypertension, you know, smoking, all these things we talked about earlier on can increase that risk to the point of maybe, um, you know, causing diabetes. And if you look at those uh, causes, um, especially the, your, your own physiological factors, right, it's, it's a moving target. So whatever caused that pancreatic beta cells to lose ability to make enough insulin or make defective insulin, it's gonna get worse over time as you get as you age, right? So even if you follow everything by the book, follow the diet, exercise, took medications, and saw you know Dr. Lee every three months, you know if the diabetes will progress for many people. Some people are lucky, and their diabetes becomes you know just stays you know kind of mild, and they just need one or two medications for years and years, right? You're lucky. Many people require more medications, even despite their best effort, right? And that's where this, uh, you know, theme of changing the treatment plan comes in, and making sure they understand it's not your failure; it's just, it's just how the disease is. Um, of course, there's a lifestyle factor as well, um, but it's, it could be multiple things. So that's all the more the reason why, you know, no one. If if somebody tells you, yeah, I was started on this medication, it's the same medication <laughs> I've been taking it for like 10 years, five years, there's something wrong with that because diabetes doesn't work like that for most people. Does that make sense? Yeah? And um, so again, you know, for this group, you know, when is the red flag, you know, should be going up, right? <clears throat> when you come across patients who, um, you know, when should we refer them to either a specialist, myself, but more commonly, again, diabetes being a, you know, epidemic, the vast majority of the diabetes is taken care of by the primary care doctor, you know, healthcare providers, uh, together with you know other health professionals, um, so you know. But when do, when should they be seen by someone like a specialist, if possible? Um, you know, I see patients when they are already on one or two or even three medications, and they're just not getting to the glycemic goal, A1C of seven or less, right? Uh, despite the best efforts by the prov provider and the patient, then I come in and try to reevaluate what's going on. Um, and you know when is that good time? Again, you know anything that's you know off target. So seven is goal, right? So anything above, they're not getting to you know a one of seven. Um, or um, at the same time, they might be having the opposite problem. They're having both elevated sugar and low blood sugar. Mm -hmm. So low blood sugar can be quite scary, right? There's actually people that can die from hypoglycemia. Your blood sugar is so low that you never wake up. So I take it very seriously in my clinic. I always ask my patients if they're having problems with low sh blood sugar. Because some of the medications we were given can cause hypoglycemia. So maybe that's the reason why they stopped taking it, because they didn't like the way it made, made them feel. So unless we're taking a detailed look at all of that, um, that could be problematic. 
in their adherence and their success in diabetes management. You had a quick question? Um, when I was working in a hospital, <coughs> we encountered the patient whose blood sugar had dropped. Mm -hmm. It was 90. Yeah. Which, you know, for anybody else, it would be normal. But for this patient, it was 90. And a normal glucose would be 70 or less. Like, it's considered low, by the mm -hmm. way. Mm -hmm. Right. But, but relative low, I've heard a lot too. They were yeah. symptomatic. Correct. He was very symptomatic. Mm -hmm. He became disoriented. He mm -hmm. was fighting. He was very. Yeah, yeah, thank you for that. Good point. So what what you're getting at is it could be it could be yeah, technically normal, but it could be low for that person mm -hmm. who's been living in glucose of 300 all the time. Mm -hmm. Now they see you know uh, Dr. Lee and I started some medications, mm -hmm. and then now it's becoming better. But in this person's body, you know the body's used to glucose of 300s, and 90 could be very low. So absolutely. So that's why you have to take the time, and you have to some, sometimes. Have close follow-up. Close follow-up. Hopefully, we'll get to the bottom of it, right? That's why I tell um, my staff is listen to what the patient is telling Absolutely. You because they know their body better than what Absolutely. You do. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if that person stopped taking the medications because you know they mm -hmm. had, they had a very terrible you know experience with low blood sugar, relatively low blood sugar. Mm -hmm. um, if somebody's requiring multiple injections of insulin, you know, continuous glucose monitor, type one diabetes. Uh, post organ transplant diabetes, um, any any acute hyperglycemia. So you can, if you have such an elevated blood sugar to the point um, of having you know acid base kind of problem, you know your your um, your body starts to use fatty acids as fuel. That's called diabetic ketoacidosis. So these are the reasons for which uh, you know specialists might come in to sort of get things um, sorted out. And then if it's a maintenance phase where things are all you know in the in the nice cruising mode then they don't necessarily have to follow up with specialists. They can certainly follow up with primary care. So, you know, diabetes, I think this group is really well aware about, you know, what it takes to be successful in chronic, you know, um, disease management. It's not just at the, you know, shoulders of the patient or the providers, but everybody in between, right? Family has to buy in. <clears throat> I have many patients who, you know, the spouse doesn't believe that you know, <clears throat> heart healthy diet is the way to go. So it just stocks the house with junk food. I mean, how hard is that when you're fighting with your own family, right? Mm -hmm. So you have to have the support of the family. You have to have the support of the you know community. Um, anybody who's involved here, you know, and fi finding out those barriers, right? Like you know, if you don't talk to that gentleman who may have had a horrible experience with glucose in the 90s, um, you, you will never understand why he likes to keep his blood sugar in the 300s, right? Mm -hmm. And th that's not really uncommon, actually. Right? Or this person who, I had one person who was working two jobs and she said um, the only way she could keep up at night while she's doing boring, like, you know, sort of uh, paperwork was to, you know, munch on junk food, right? And she was getting like three hours of sleep. And then she tells me why her A1C is like 14, right? So I told her to basically stop nighttime, you know, junk food and try to, you know, just basically, you know, um, move her schedule around, because like, she was working, working out like two hours a day. And I said, stop working out, get some sleep, <laughs> and you know, try to do those boring work when you're not requiring junk food to stay up. And then she, you know, she got better. So I mean, these are the emotional sort of you know, interviewing about figuring out some projects that are really, you know, it could only come out when you really understand the person beyond just what's on the paper, right? Mm -hmm. And I would say diabetes.org you know, is a great website for anyone. It's got a great resource on pre-diabetes, healthy eating in general, um, diabetes, type 1 and type 2. It should be fairly easy for anyone. This is a very patient-friendly website because uh, the ones for the providers is actually called Pro Professional Diabetes. There's actually a link that you, know, you can go to uh, for providers. But for patients, this is you know, um, geared towards patients, really. Yeah. It actually has um, recipe and menu, yeah. and, it, and it provides a shopping list. Like if somebody mm -hmm. wants to go ahead and do this particular meal setup for a yeah. potential dinner, it provides a shopping list. So when whoever goes to the store, they know it's, I have this in my refrigerator, I need to get this right. resource. Fantastic. Yeah, and they actually have um, s some resources in different languages too. Yeah. So just, you know, I think this is chock full of good resources. Um, so just briefly, you know, let's play, um, play a little scenario game here. So. You have Mr. Jones, who you've come, up, come across, 58 years old, type 2 diabetes, diagnosed about a year ago. Um, he says, yeah, I take metformin you know, twice a day. My primary doctor told me to start this. Um, and um, you know, I've been cutting out my you know, 
junk food and I've been trying to really turn around my lifestyle. Um, and uh, my A1C last month was 8.3%. Uh, I think I'm pretty good, you know, what should I do? So, you know, I mean, the last time we saw, you know, this primary care doctor was six months, over six months ago. So based on what we discussed, you know, what would you recommend? He certainly needs a follow-up appointment. Mm -hmm. He needs a more closer follow-up. Yeah. Well, surprisingly, what I start is I congratulate him. Mm -hmm. Everybody likes to be congratulated. So I con congratulations. You've made some positive, you know, changes. And if it wasn't for your positive changes, your A1C is probably worse. Mm -hmm. It's true. And he's probably adhering to medication, which you, is another reason to be congratulated for, right? And then you say you could do better, right? 8.3, 8 while it's better than you know, otherwise, if you didn't do all these things, it's not quite a goal. And the goal here is to prevent all these you know, terrible complications in the long run. Mm -hmm. um, and you certainly need care to, you know, to see someone to maybe modify your medications. Um, tell them about the diabetes being progressive disease, so sometimes it's just not enough with m one medication, you often need more than that. And uh, make sure he's not feeling like, like a failure, you know, by you pointing out, oh yeah, your A1C is not at goal, you know, shame on you. But that's not what we're trying to do, right? So that's the kind of thing that I would, um, you know, have you register in your mind. Um, and if that person is still not at goal after seeing, you know, working with a primary care doctor, perhaps, you know, yeah. Um, diabetes specialists like myself would would be helpful too in in, in that picture. Um, so let's summarize here. Our time's up. So diabetes, as you know, it means too much blood sugar, uh, likely because your insulin production is not normal, or insulin got guidelines on how to diagnose diabetes. And there are multiple medications and insulins and injectable medications nowadays that makes uh, diabetes management. You know, we don't have a cure, but we have a pretty decent, you know, armamentarium of, uh, you know, treatment options to manage diabetes. Um, and really, the long-term goal is to not make your blood sugar pretty and feel good about it, but make all the other risk factors reduced as much as possible to ensure a good cardiovascular health. Okay. So, any questions? Yes. For so for folks who are um, type two diabetic unless say they're just on um, an oral um, anti-glucose medication. Yep. What is the recommendation for them to be checking their blood sugars? That's a very good question. So that's a very uh, uh, in-depth question and I appreciate that. So if their A1C is reasonably under good control, let's say it's hovering between seven and eight, which is kind of near your, where you want to go, mm -hmm. that person needs, does not need to torture themselves with you know, checking their glucose you know, before each meal or like multiple times a day. Because mm -hmm. what are you going to do with the numbers? So you, you know, I, I checked my glucose when I was pregnant and it very hurts. You know, I'm, I wish it didn't hurt, but I've got to tell you, I've got to be honest, it hurts. So what I tell patients is uh, you know, if there's a reason to have that number so you can act on it, mm -hmm. That's a, that's a good way to manage it. So it, it really depends on the situation and with your primary doctor or specialist. Mm -hmm. But if things are in relatively good control, they may not even need to check glucose on a daily basis. Because what are you going to do with that number, right? right? But if things are not going the right direction, that's when I do some detective work with my patients. Mm -hmm. So let's say metformin, A1C of 7.2, we're high-fiving each other, things look good. Six months later, the patient comes back, metformin, A1 is now 8.9. Mm -hmm. Well, now, Mr. Jones, I'd like you to go home, check your blood sugar when you wake up, mm -hmm. check your blood sugar two, hour, two hours after dinner, and give me like one week of report to me. You know, mail me, email me, or you know, um, you know, call me. And then we do something with that work. You know, if I, if I know that he's waking up with horrible blood sugar in the morning, that calls for different medications versus if he's waking up fine, but it's that meal, after a meal he's going sky high, it's another type of medication I have to think about. So does that make sense? So it really depends on uh, what you're gonna do with that number, because you know, it's, it's a lot of work. But if, in general, if you are on insulin, you're gonna need daily uh, check-in, because in insulin is really elevates the risk for low blood sugar and things, so there's a reason for monitoring at that point. But if you're just on oral medications, you don't have to monitor necessarily. It depends on what your A1C or your overall glucose control is. But that's a very, very good question. Anything else? All right, well, you're ready to go out and uh, identify those people at high risk and uh, send them to the right directions and things. And um, again, thank you for the opportunity. And uh, thank you. yeah, thank you. Yeah, enjoy the rest of the day.